All right, now we're starting talking about substitutions. Oftentimes called U substitutions, but I kind of like to call them substitutions because U is really an arbitrary letter that we just choose to use. That being said, it's the right letter because we're used to it in the same way that X is the right variable because we're used to it. So uh, substitutions. Here's another thing that I sometimes do. And that's a, if I have generated slides for this, I will put the slides on that reading assignment page. It's kind of reading assignment and other resources. So I generated some slides for this first section, but not the section second section of what we're going to cover. So we'll start with slides, but that's not the right place for those. Okay, what am I doing? All right, grab under your pencils. It's time. Substitutions. Uh, I organize my slides when I, I won't, I don't always have slides. Sometimes we'll just fire up the regular old board with a marker because that math class works really well, it turns out. But if I do generate slides, I try to have an outline of what we're talking about on the right hand side of them so you can tell what section we're in and what we're talking about. And then it generates a table of contents at the beginning. So differentiation is the opposite operation of integration, right? They undo each other. And so since chain rule is a very, very, very powerful tool with respect to differentiation, it's so-called like mirror or uh, same process in the reverse, they're inverse operations, differentiation and uh, integration are inverses, two inverses to reverse each other. So the inverse operation of chain rule, chain rule is to use a substitution. So take a look at the chain rule, you got f of g of x with the prime, meaning the derivative of everything in there, the composite function is derivative of the outside guy evaluated at the inside guy times the derivative of the inside guy, f primed of g of x times g primed of x. So in reverse, that looks like this. You have to have some criteria. You say, okay, you let u represent g of x, the function on the inside. And it's a differential function with range uh, over interval i. You have to decree that uh, the derivative of f is continuous on i. And that's because you're going to plug some stuff into each other. And if it's not continuous, and well, we're getting into that. But so like we said earlier, or we thought about earlier, is this set up right? Yeah, that'll work. Thinking of integration as having a derivative inside And then when you integrate a derivative, you find the original function, yeah? Uh, so I like shorthand fn ctn, leaving out vowels as function. So this is the derivative and ignoring the prime thing here, the inside is the function, right? That you took the derivative of. So what do we have down here? We have the integral of a derivative and then this theorem, the way that it's written in textbooks in here looks kind of funny to me, right? F prime to u. Well, what would F prime to u be? Well, that's the derivative of a function F of u. So if we integrate a derivative, we get the original function F of u. We just made a substitution that, because this thing collapses down to this derivative and it makes it a little more clear, I actually think it's a little better to just kind of bypass all of this and say, this expression is the derivative of what? This expression is the derivative of the original composite function f of g of x. Does that make some sense? All right. Um, good enough for that first slide because we're just reversing the chain rule. That's the point of that. So when do you use a substitution? The key idea is when you see a function and multiplication by its derivative somewhere in there. If you look back at this slide, you're like, substitutions work when you see a function, a function and multiplication or division, like its derivative somewhere, maybe it's in a denominator or something, but a function and its derivative, a function and its derivative. So if you see those two things, the method is to identify the function and its derivative, and you let u equal the function, and then du dx, you calculate the derivative of that u with respect to x, and then you use this, use facts number two to substitute the above into your integral, and then you integrate with respect to u. And then you back substitute in terms of the original variable. That's our goal. Okay, so let's do a bunch of these just for kicks and giggles. Uh, da, 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 da. Really, I bothered to type this one out. It seems silly, does it? 
Yeah, okay, we'll do this one. Okay, so to emphasize this, what do we see here? Where's the function and where is its derivative? Exactly, you see the function and something that looks, in this case, it is exactly the derivative. It could also be, it, you'll see problems where this is six X squared plus two. That's the derivative in disguise, just multiplied by two that you'd have to factor out to see. Okay. So, all right, uh, it said to, I don't even remember. What do I, how do I want to do this? Yeah, okay, so we'll follow the process. All right, u is gonna be the function. u is equal to x to the third plus x. Then we calculate the derivative, du dx. We're taking the derivative of our function u with respect to x. Okay, that's some power rule action. 3x squared has derivative three times two, drop down that exponent. Three times two gives me six. x two minus one, subtract one from the exponent. Derivative of three x squared is six x. Derivative of plus one is plus zero, but you know, we'll, we'll let that slide. We don't need that. Oh God. Can we, how about you just forgive me and we pretend I didn't say any of that, right? Because it's all wrong. Why is it wrong? What did I do? I wrote down this as the function. This is the thing I should be differentiating, not this. Why would I look at that and take, because I have the word derivative there and my brain got a little mixed up. Okay, so let's do the, what we actually meant to do. Du dx is equal to derivative of three X is three X squared. Derivative of X is one plus one. Okay, so what do we have? Well, this seems a little tedious, but I'm actually going to just rewrite the integral down here because I'd like to write underneath it. Integral of X to the third plus X all raised to the fifth power times the quantity three X squared plus one. When I say the quantity, that usually means there's a set of parentheses around it. So what do we have under this transformation? Du, uh, oh yeah, 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 I know what we're gonna do. Well, there's a dx down here. So you can take and algebra differentials. What I mean by that is I can solve du dx over dx is equal to three x squared plus one and make it into du equals three x squared plus one quantity times dx. I can kind of multiply that differential over to the other side. And then once I've done that, I see that I can just do a direct substitution. That thing right there, that entire expression of three x squared plus one dx is equal to du. And we make our substitution. You know, I'm just following the steps here. It says use the function du dx is its derivative. It just says to use that information to substitute it in somehow. We chose to just find it directly and substitute it in. And so, all right, this, this integral now in terms of u becomes, well, everything in the parentheses there raised to the fifth power is u, and we just have u to the fifth power, which is a piece of cake. We can integrate with respect to the power, but like that's just power rule. I think you add one, u to the five plus one is six times one over six, so that when you take the derivative in reverse, it would take care of the coefficient that would drop down and you'd be left with just what you had inside. Am I finished? Absolutely not, because our original problem started in terms of x, and so our result should be in terms of x. I'm not a huge stickler on adding plus c at this point in time, uh, probably should as long as it shows up at the final answer is really, that's where we need to see it. So reverse substituting out of terms of u, u is this expression right up here. So we'll reverse that substitution to get one sixth times the quantity x to the third plus x all raised to the sixth power plus c is the result of our integral. Sorry for a bumpy road. I went completely off the cuff and didn't go off what I had written there, but so. This one worked out pretty nicely, right? Does it always work such that we're gonna be able to find exactly the right expression of the differential? 
No, I kind of already alluded to that fact up there that oftentimes it doesn't show up exactly. So did we work this one twice? No, we didn't. But uh, we're going to get into there are two ways to do substitutions, and they both have value. Like in some of the techniques we're going to see later in this course, this method of finding exactly the, the, the really differential is going to be so helpful. But I actually prefer to do things a different way. And so I'll show you how I do it on the next example. Lots of examples slated up here and lined up. Ready, steady, go. Get a black marker going here. All right. In general, when, yeah, in general for substitutions, what do you look for for your, your, uh, your substitution? Uh, function and its derivative, right? But sometimes it's hard to see a function and its derivative. If you can't immediately see it, in general, what is your substitution best going to be? Putting you on the spot all kinds today. I promise. No critique, no judgment. So when you're doing substitutions, what did you notice about our choice of a function? Where was it located? Uh, yeah, but I could switch the order real and it'd still be the same, right? But it said the answer was beginning. It's kind of located somewhere a little special. We just, we could just, I'm not looking for fancy math words here, but more loose concepts. It's, it's to the power of five. It's trapped inside, that keyword is inside of another function. Because typically you're gonna make the substitution and that, that is gonna be something, it becomes u to the fifth, much easier than a polynomial to the fifth. Uh, so in general, when you're hunting for substitutions, if you don't directly see the derivative, which is oftentimes kind of tricky to see, your substitution, if you're just going to try something to see if it works, which is a good technique, the more you do it, the better you get it, the more you'll be like, oh yeah, now I see why that was right, is to look for the function that's trapped inside of another one. So for this function, five uh, integrating five times secant raised to the second, secant squared of five X plus one, you got kind of a few things you could kind of see inside of each other. You could be like, I got secant to have some stuff all squared. And you can focus on that. But what I see is I see five X plus one. And so that to me looks like it's trapped inside of a secant function. And so we're gonna try that one. And it seems like a reasonable good thing to try because looking everywhere else, I see five X to the one, I see five. Those are kind of related differentially. Maybe it's, it's exactly, but it won't always be exact. Constants are fine. Secant squared is the derivative, because we're looking, integral of derivative gives us original function. Secant squared is the derivative of, it's one of them. It's one of the six key, key trig functions. It's sine has derivative cosine, cosine has derivative negative sine, tangent has derivative, kind of weird, secant squared. So the derivative of a tangent is secant squared here. And so knowing that secant, oops, whoops, knowing that tangent squared, goodness, I can't talk. The derivative of tangent is secant squared. We see that, hey, if I can take care of that nasty 5x stuff inside, I'm going to turn it into a problem I can do. So let's try that. We will make our substitution. We'll say u is equal to 5x plus 1. You know what? I'm going to just do this problem twice. Two ways to show the two methods of doing it. Okay. So du dx, du dx is equal to just 5. And then solving that thing for du, you get du is equal to 5 dx. And oh snap. We got 5 dx in our original thing. It's, gonna, it's going to substitute directly, but I will rewrite that because I want to, okay. So our problem, integral five secant squared of five X plus one DX becomes under this substitution, it becomes, well, I'm gonna use some colors here because I've got them and I might as well, but I'll also try and make it reasonable to copy. DX and five are gonna be directly substituted in for DU. So I'm going to get integral of, well, those two things are going to become my, my du, du. So what am I left with? I'm left with secant 
squared of u. Sorry, that kind of crammed in there a little bit, but you're with me? All right, now secant squared of u, we know that secant squared is the derivative of tangent, and therefore the integral of secant squared is tangent of u. I'll slap a plus c on there, right? And now we don't want u to be our answer. We want to reverse that substitution, tangent of 5x plus 1 plus c. And we've done it. Is that how you do these, or do you do them differently? OK, that is cool. I'm going to show you how I do it. It's different, actually. So same process, same idea, same everything. Uh, same substitution. u is equal to 5x plus 1, a slight different treatment of the differentials. du dx is equal to 5. Well, yes, that gives us du is equal to 5 dx. But here, I want to actually think about just directly substituting in for dx. So I'm going to solve for dx here. That means I'm going to divide both sides by 5. I'm going to get 1 fifth du is equal to dx. You with me? OK. So under this substitution, integral of 5 secant squared of 5x plus 1 dx becomes, well, I am going to use, again, blue to represent the substitutions here. For 5x plus 1, I'm going to just replace that with u. Yeah? And for dx, I'm going to replace it with the entire expression of 1 -fifth du. Does it seem reasonable in math that if you have something equals to a single thing, you can substitute in for that thing? Yeah, we've been doing that since the beginning of when we learned to substitute things in math. So instead of squiggly here, let me use a dashed line to differentiate these. Okay, so let's make those substitutions now. All right, the, the thing here is, notice I didn't address the five yet. It doesn't, it doesn't fit into the way I'm doing it, so we're just gonna leave it there. Well, it's a constant. We know we can pull a constant through. It would be fine in the long run, but this is where the magic happens. Okay, secant squared of uh, u. And then dx becomes this entire expression of 1 fifth dx. Uh, du, 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 apologies, one-fifth du. Does that make sense? Oops. And so we're doing the dotted line for one-fifth du. I'll be a little anal here, because you know what? In math class, being a little anal is a good thing, because otherwise it's you get confused. So they're just constants, no big deal. And what's happened is we just manipulated this derivative, basically. We took them and just moved them around, and it's going to reduce away there. Because effectively, even though I don't have the dots in between there, it's just things being multiplied together. With me? All right, and that gives us uh, integral. We end up with secant squared of u du. Oh man, it's, I mean, it's, it really does result in the same thing, no matter what. It's the same, pro it's the same problem. You'll always get the same answer. Secant squared has derivative tangent of u. And we know that to reverse the substitution, we get the exact same answer, tangent of 5x plus 1 plus c. Both are very, very legitimate ways to do it. Um, yeah, they're both good. They both serve a purpose. Some problems are easier with one. Other problems are easier with the other. OK, so let's just do some stuff now. Uh, this one, what should our u be? Yep, you bet. OK, so uh, u is equal to 7x plus 3. That means du. Uh, dx is equal to 7x. Oh, no, you have to take the derivative. It's equal to 7. Uh, derivative of 7x plus 3 is just 7. These little double equal signs with an arrow on either or a single equal sign with an arrow means implies. This is a nice way to progress from one mathematical equation to another without equals would be bad because they're not actually equal. you got to manipulate it. It's a pretty standard thing. Double arrow means it goes both ways. Yeah, you multiply up by dx, you divide by the 7. Solving for dx, we would get dx is equal to 1 7 du. With me there? OK. So when I do these problems, oftentimes I will like to structure it like this. I'll, I'll write the original problem. I'll do the u substitution underneath it. 
and then I'll draw a little arrow that shows I'm making the substitution here. You don't have to do this. I just, it really helps me keep track of things. All right, so stop that. All right, integral. What have we done? We've got cosine. You just leave things alone. You substitute for what you chose, and then you put in dx. You substitute for it directly. So we get one over seven dx. Cool, I can deal with that. That's just one seventh outside equals one seventh integral cosine of u. And I bet you, you all don't need to do that one seventh out. I'm just kind of reviewing integral rules that you're allowed to pull the constant value through and then do the integral. Well, what has derivative of cosine? Sine has derivative of cosine and sine's derivative of cosine is positive. So you don't have to worry about the negative signs. Uh, S-I-G-N-S plus C. So we end up with one seventh sine of, uh, let's reverse our substitution. We don't want this U in there. So sine of seven X plus three plus C. That's the way I like to do these. Cause in this problem, we didn't have the derivative of that hidden inner function. We just had a relatively nice inner function which gives us a constant. We don't care about constants. I've always found it easiest to do the algebra here and directly substitute for dx and it just, everything works, it does. Okay, x squared cosine x to the third. You know what, this is a boring problem. You can already see that x, well, no, it's not. No, it's good, I like it, Never mind. All right, so our substitution is u is equal to x to the third, the thing that's hidden inside. du dx is equal to three x squared. That implies that uh, one over three x squared du is equal to dx, yes? Make the substitution. Using this substitution, well, we're just gonna leave that x squared alone. You know what, leave it alone. We're not substituting in for it. We're only going to substitute u in for the thing we chose it to, cosine of u, x to the third. And we're going to replace the entire differential dx with 1 over 3x squared dx. Du, du, du. Sorry. And now what do we notice? What can we do? equals circle star, circle star equals picking up the problem without rewriting it and starting again. Well, I don't totally see what to do, but I don't like the order in which it's written. Do you? It's kind of ugly. I don't like cosine separating the X stuff. So let's just put it all together. Let's rearrange X squared times, and maybe putting the, the multiplication bullets might help give us an idea as what to what to do here. What can we do now? You could. What do you want to do with eight tenths? What do you want to do with three sixths? You bet. Three six is infinitely worse than half, right? Half is half is half is half. And if I can make it better, you bet I'm gonna reduce it, right? So you're absolutely right. You can multiply those things together and get X squared over three X squared. But in the same way that you have um, two times five over, oh God, two times, two times seven, whatever, it doesn't matter. What do you want to do with that? You want to do this, yes? Yeah, I want to do that. Five sevenths is much better than 10 fourteenths. And for that reason, we can do that, yeah? And I want us to work towards being able to recognize that we can do that there. You with me? Yeah. And then what do we have? Well, now, once we've reduced what that derivative way, and this, if a u substitution is going to work, that will always happen. When you substitute in for dx in terms of the differential du and whatever other x stuff is involved in the derivative here, some type of reducing like we see in the red here will happen with that derivative and you'll be left with just stuff that is in terms of u. 
And that tells you that the substitution worked. With me? All right. So pop that one third outside. Integral cosine of u. What has the derivative of u or cosine? Rather, once again, sine does. So one third sine of u plus c. Reverse your substitution. One third sine of x to the third power plus c. And we've done it. The other way of doing this with this problem is a little harder. If you want to try and do a direct substitution, you have to do du is equal to 3x squared dx from our original differential calculation. You with me there? And then you have to say, well, we don't have 3x dx. What we have is x squared dx. So I guess what we need to do is we need to make this thing one third du, and we need to put one third du in for my x dx. Does that make sense? And yes, you can do that, but my way of doing it, I'm not calling, it's my way, it's the way I do, I didn't invent this. Um, my way of doing it, all that algebra will come out to be the same always, and it tends to be a lot easier. What, my friends? is the integral of tangent of x. Nope. So think about the integral is asking, this thing is the derivative of what? Nope. I mean, I'm, I'm being mean and nice to you all at the same time. And I'm, I'm, I'm greatly appreciating you're willing to answer these things and not always be right. It's okay. I'm not always right either. I'm just most of the time right because I'm the teacher and I'm, I'm always right. No, um, so let's check this little guy out because this little guy right here, this little guy is a very nice summary of the trig derivatives. So tangent is the derivative of what? Means that we would look for the result of taking the derivative. D dx of sine means the derivative of sine, yeah? And so we're looking on the right and I don't see tangent anywhere by itself as the derivative of any of the six trig functions. And I don't really see, I mean, I guess it's involved with secant. I guess if we had secant, if that bottom left one, if we solved tangents, the uh, derivative of secant to secant tangent for just tangent, we would have, the function secant, one over secant times the derivatives, uh, we don't have that, right? So, hmm, what can we do? Think back to pre-calculus. Whenever you had tangent or something, what did you do? Who likes tangent? What are your favorite pre-calculus functions? There are two of them. Well, there are six trigonometric functions, right? What are your favorite two trig functions? That is the correct answer. Cosine and sine all the way, all year. Why? Because all the other ones are because of those two. So let's try that. Let's take tangent and make it into it's what it is in terms of sine and cosine. So tangent is equal to sine over cosine. Sine of x over cosine of x dx. And we didn't do a algebra per se, all we did was apply a known trig rule to rewrite something. Now, we're talking about this problem in a section about substitutions. And substitutions are all about a function and its derivative, right? We're looking for a function and its derivative. Now that I've written tangent as sine over cosine, do I see a function and its derivative? in both ways, kind of. You can make an argument because it's up to a constant, negative one. Cosine has derivative sine-ish and sine has derivative cosine-ish. So yeah, it seems like a promising start. So which one of these should we make our substitution? U is equal to which, sine or cosine? Two, pick one. I was gonna say pick one, you did it, that's awesome. Okay, you know what? We're gonna put a pin in this. That way I don't have to rewrite it. You may, your paper may look different than mine. I'm gonna do the substitution. U is equal to sine of x dx. No, oh, no, 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 no. U is equal to sine of x. Now, 
du dx is equal to cosine of x. That gives us that dx multiplied up to the right and cosine divided down to the left with me? Or should I show that? I'll show it if you want me to. Putting you on the spot. Want me to show it to you? Work the algebra? Yeah, I would love to. It's going to help in this class if you can get to the point where this is something that you can see and do. But that is zero pressure. Every time I teach this, people always say, start off showing me the algebra. And I will happily. So, all right, we're going to solve for dx. To do that, du dx is equal to cosine of x. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to get rid of that dx out of the basement. So we're going to multiply both sides by dx. That's going to give us du is equal to cosine of x dx. Yeah? Now, I want to solve for dx. You know, your gut instinct is going to tell me divide by cosine. And I want everyone in the room virtually listening, anyone who ever watches this, to hold out their hand and gently slap themselves on the wrist. Because dividing by stuff is so played out, it's much better to multiply. Why multiply? Because you can reduce things. And du over cosine of x, is it wrong? No, but yes, we're playing fast and loose when we're algebraing these differentials a little bit. So opinion here, I like to multiply by whatever we're trying to get rid of because you're just multiplying a bunch of things and that reducing can happen. And then you have, I think, a little nicer version of dx. You have dx is equal to one over cosine of x du, and you keep that differential off to the side by itself, because frankly, they're kind of antisocial. They like to hang out off to the side by them. They don't like being divided by things. I just anthropomorphized our differentials, but I'm okay with that. So anthropomorphize, anthro, human, morphize, put human characteristics upon. Okay, ready? Uh, let's make the substitution. Uh, we stuck a pin in it, so let's come back to our original problem with the circle star. Under this substitution, we are going to have, what, what, what is even our substitution? You know what, let's highlight it just to kind of help see what we're doing here. Okay, under our substitution, we have not, we have touched the sign. So the sign is replaced with a U. We have not touched that cosine in the basement. So we're going to leave that cosine in the basement. With me? And now, now, I'm going to replace dx. dx is this entire expression of 1 over cosine of x dx. Or du, du. I keep doing that. I'm sorry. du. Now we stand back and we look at this and we think to ourselves, did that help? Now I have du and u and two cosine x's floating around. Now I, the thing that I wanted to happen, this nice little reducing that happened over here didn't happen here. I don't see a way around it. I think that's actually worse than what we started with because you got two variables and no one likes two variables, at least not in Calc 2. So you know what, let's try again. Had you chosen correctly with your U substitution, I would have forced you to try this one anyway because it's a valuable tool to say and see and experience and, and show that sometimes a U sub doesn't work out. Doesn't mean you're wrong. Well, yeah, it actually does mean you're wrong, but it doesn't mean to quit. It means to try something else. So we tried sine, let's try cosine. U is equal to cosine of X. DU DX is equal to derivative of cosine is negative sine of X. Going to do the algebra again, just for kicks and giggles. All right, we're going to take this thing. We're going to take du dx is equal to negative sine of x. We want to get rid of du. So we will multiply both sides by dx to start off with and get that dx up there. Rewriting things, du is equal to negative sine of x dx. You know what? I don't want that sin, negative sine of x in there. So I'm going to multiply by 1 over negative sine of x. That will reduce that guy on the right, and that will show up with the same expression, one over negative sine of x on the left. Feeling good? Good, I'm feeling great. All right, so I'm going to summarize that back up here, and I'm gonna say du, uh, u is cosine of x, if and only if, 
1 over negative sine of x du is equal to dx. And this is going to be the substitution we're going to make when we resume with circle star below. So now under this substitution, I substituted for cosine. So we'll start by, I like to do it in this process, focus on what the original substitution was. I substituted for the cosine in the denominator. So I'll put u in there. And then before I think about the dx, I think what else is there in that original problem that's not part of that dx and that's sine x, I didn't touch that guy. Yeah, it shows up in the other, I don't care. I, just, I didn't touch that guy, it's gotta be left alone. So sine of x there. Now for dx, the entire expression of dx is gonna be replaced with one over negative sine of x dx. And this time, some algebras happen. We got two fractions being multiplied that have something the same on the top and the bottom. You bet, that's just definition of reducing factors. Sometimes I do things like this. Why? Because that little guy is real easy to disappear. So um, I'm gonna go right on ahead. And you know what? We're gonna say equals negative. We're gonna slap that out in front of our integral so we don't forget about that negative sign. Because one over negative one, you guys definitely know that one over negative one is negative one. So pull that negative one through. What do we have? We have one over u d, I did it again. D u is what that's supposed to say. Uh, one over one du. Huh. What has the derivative of one over, what is the derivative of one over x? Do you want a hint? Involves logarithms and exponentials. Exactly. Yep, natural log. Ln of x has derivative one over x. So one over u is the derivative of negative ln of u. Now I put an absolute value around the c and, uh, or I'm sorry, around the u. And that has to do with the domain of natural log. This example is more about substitutions than it is the intricacies of why there's an absolute value around there. We'll hit upon it later in this course and we'll talk about it then. But right now, just trust me, the important part was the substitution. We're not done. I kind of wanted to be done because I feel like I've done a lot, but don't forget, we've got our answer in terms of the wrong variable. So let's back substitute negative ln of absolute value. Our u that worked was cosine of x in the absolute values plus c and we're done. I just really like that example because every time in every class I've done it, like I said, if somebody chooses cosine and sees that that's the right substitution, I say, nope, let's try sine and we get it wrong and then we'd work. The, back to our conversation about how do you choose which one? If you've got just a fraction, sine over cosine, which one's kind of hidden inside another function? And I'm using air quotes in here. Kind of the one that's in the denominator is hidden inside of a, like a one over, whereas the sign is just being multiplied out in front. Does that kind of make sense? So that's a just another way you can think about them to help you identify the thing on the inside. Now, spoiler alert, I wrote the spoiler on this one, and that's okay. But in your homeworks, the spoiler alert probably won't be there. So let's look at this thing and let's just work through it together and see if we can, we can uh, don't read it. I mean, it's there, but let's not read it. Let's see if we can come up with it. Okay, so what would you like to try for your U substitution? Reckless confidence, absolutely right. The thing that's trapped under the root, two X plus one, let's do it. Okay, I'm gonna just, I, I like to do my substitutions like this. So I wanna rewrite it. You know, it's, some people do a little tick mark down on the end of a root. That way, like variables don't accidentally sneak in front of it. And it's a habit I've picked up. I think it's a good one. Anyway, u is equal to 2x plus 1. u equals 2x plus 1. du dx is equal to 2. That's going to give us that dx is equal to 1 over half du. Skip to that algebra. I greatly encourage you to work the algebra on your homeworks. The more you work the algebra, the quicker it'll actually register and it'll click and it'll be like, oh yeah, times that guy up, divide that guy down, got it. Um, okay, ready, steady, go. We've got ourselves a substitution. So we'll make that substitution. Our integral becomes just 
touch the part you changed. Square root of u. We didn't address the x out in front, so that x stays. dx is directly going to substitute in as 1 over 2 du. 1 over 2 du. Once again, we find ourselves in the ugly situation of having two different variables in there. And we kind of like, well, I guess I'll try again. And maybe I'd go back to the drawing board and try x for the differential. And you're going to run into the same problem again, where you got 2x plus 1 is not going to reduce away under a root or anything. And so usually with a problem where your substitution is relatively simple, it's not like we don't have 2x to the third plus x squared. or It's just, a, it's just 2x plus 1. It's just constants and things. What we can do is we can rewrite other parts of our integral sometimes. You can sort of re, I'm going to write this, reuse our substitution. So what is our substitution? Our substitution is 2u equals 2x plus 1. All I see is an x. And in my substitution, I see I only have an x. So is it theoretically possible to just isolate that x in the substitution? Solve for x in u equals 2x plus 1. We can do that, yeah? Let's try that. Solve for x. Re use our substitution. Okay, so we've got u is equal to 2x plus 1. u minus 1 equals 2x. To get rid of the first, we'll get rid of the plus 1, subtract 1 on both sides. Now we'll, you know what, you can divide by 2 if you want to, be wrong. But uh, I think multiplying by 1 half might be nice. It's not wrong either way. The algebra is going to be easier if instead of dividing by 2, and you'll see why in a moment, we multiply both sides by one half to get rid of that. Does that make sense? Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to apply this substitution again. I'm going to say x is equal to this stuff. And if I do that, then at least everything's in terms of u. And who knows? Maybe I'll get lucky. Okay. Ready, steady, go. We'll do that. Okay. That means we're going to get integral of one half times, I guess I should maybe use red here. We'll just use dotted lines underneath it. u minus 1, end quantity, square root of u, 1 half du. It still looks kind of ugly, doesn't it? But you know what? In some way, it looks a lot better than the other thing. Let's now ask ourselves, integral and algebra skills, what can we do to make this thing better? That's OK. Uh, what about the constants? Do we care if there are numbers being multiplied in there? Anything wrong with looking at that 1 half? Well, 1 half times 1 half would give us 1 fourth, right? And then if you have a constant, you, you can pop them out in front of the integral, can't you? Is that legal? I mean, I'm asking you, but I know it's legal. All right, so now let's, that tidies things up a little bit. u minus one, square root of u, du. Now off to the side, since this is day one, we're gonna do a little bit of review here, which is gonna be the spoiler of how to finish this. Not the spoiler I referred to earlier, but how do we work as an aside? How do we do the integral of the square root of x? Well, square root of x is what as an exponent? x to the, nailed it, 1 half. 1 half dx. How do you integrate something to the power? You add 1. x to the 1 half plus 1 is 3 halves. And you, you do 1 over 3 halves, right? But that is really just 2 thirds, yeah? Cool. 2 thirds. You can always say no to me when I say this stuff, too. And, and I will explain it. I'm happy to. 2 thirds. All right. I feel good about that. Think that would help us over here? Let's try it. So I'm going to make that one fourth. I'm being lazy. Don't want to write more than I have to. 
U minus one quantity times U to the one half power DU. Now, I don't know. I don't know about you guys, but I like distributing things from the left. I like to do three X plus one pew pew better than I like to do X plus one times three pew pew. But I could both ways. It's legal both ways, right? So that's what we're going to do. I see a bunch of U's and I don't like, I'm just going to distribute these rigs and see what happens. One fourth integral. Now, when you are multiplying powers, x times x to the third is x to the fourth, one plus three, right? So one plus one half gives us u to the three halves. And then minus, well, anything times one is just itself. So u to the one half du. Now, if we manage to do square root of x as a fractional exponent, but just integrating the fractional exponent off to the right in blue, we should be able to integrate u to the two three halves and u to the one half just as fractional exponents applying the power rule. So we're going to do that. I'm going to move over here just to give myself a little bit more room. I apologize. Sometimes these slides that like, it's, yeah, it's not always the best. On my paper, use lots of paper, go straight below each other. Don't do this convoluted arrow stuff that I do, but hopefully it's easy to follow. All right, one fourth times, let's use a big set of square brackets so I don't forget to distribute that one fourth. It's, but it's the square bracket, meaning it's still outside the integral. I'm not worrying about the one fourth yet. All right, u to the three halves plus two. Three halves plus one is three halves plus two over two is five halves. Uh, one over five halves is two fifths minus u to the one half plus two over two is three halves. And then one over three halves is two thirds. All right, plus C, why not? We'll tack it on now. And then let's just reverse our substitution. And I don't care. Let's just leave that one fourth out front and let it be. Ready? Equals one fourth. I didn't realize I was gonna need this much room, but it was a good choice to go to the left here. One fourth, big square parenthesis. I'm gonna switch to a round parenthesis for no reason other than I just like them better. Uh, two fifths little round parenthesis because we're about to reverse that u substitution got to go back and remember where it is happily i highlighted it in yellow circling them on your paper is kind of good practice um 2x plus 1 2x plus 1 raised to the 5 halves power minus 2 thirds times the quantity 2x plus 1 raised to the 3 halves power end parenthesis plus c and we've done it we nailed it we're above average and gosh darn it people like us who we what's up with that yeah that is an exceptionally useful trick it doesn't happen very often but if you're stuck on a problem and you've tried several different u substitutions and none of them have worked go back through and look at it and think is there any way i can reuse that initial substitution to get it all in terms of u and oftentimes there is not oftentimes Textbook problems, yeah. Turns out integration is really hard. You'll see that for the rest of this semester. All right, example. Uh, oh, I gave myself two pages and didn't even need it. Next, sine squared of x dx. Now, if you took my class, I would have beat it into you. Oh, that's not true. I would have tried the proverbial beat it into you through asking you to practice this lots and lots, that this is an important integral that can be solved with an important trig identity. Now, it's not one that I have memorized for any reason other than integrations, but I'm going to tell you what it is. Sine squared of x is equal to uh, 1 minus cosine of 2x all over two. Now, that's the way it's usually presented in trig textbooks and when you're looking at things. But you know what? Division played out. So let's write this as one half times one minus cosine of twice x. Let's just go ahead and just park this little guy right there. Not because it's a substitution, but just because it's going to come to play an important role in a lot of integrals at a point in this class. Uh, on your own, I'm not going to grade this, but I'm going to assign it right now. Homework. D 
do integral of cosine squared of x dx. Yeah, do integral of cosine squared of x dx and bring it for next time. Will I check you? No. Will I remember this? No. If you remind me, will we go over it? Oh, yes. So do it. Um, ready, steady, go. Well, we are going to put a pin in it because that's what I want to do. And then I'm going to say, hey, guess what? In that pin in it, we're going to use this substitution. Uh, so integral of sine squared becomes 1 half times 1 minus cosine of twice x dx. Now, there's lots of ways to do this problem. Um, because some people like to do it this way. They like to say, hey, this is 1 half minus 1 half cosine of 2x. And you can do it that way as well. Doesn't matter. This just happens to be my favorite way. So what we're going to do is we're going to pull the 1 half out. We're going to get 1 minus cosine of 2x dx. Now, here's where things can get a little bit tricky. So we'll just do it twice, tricky way, and then the sneaky way, because it's not necessarily obvious. What would you like to do here? Let's do a u substitution and make it 2x. Hint, this is the what people want to do. You, and it's not wrong. You just have to be a little careful with it. So u is equal to 2x. That is going to give us that du dx is equal to 2, which if and only if we solve for dx, we get 1 half du is equal to dx. We make this substitution to see that we have 1 half integral 1 minus cosine of u. Hmm. And I want to write 1 half du. Why did I say hmm in a rather Muppet-like voice? We've got more than one thing floating around here. Kind of with me there? That 1 half is not just being multiplied by the cosine. It's being multiplied by the 1 minus cosine. And it's all good. In the next line, what we're going to do is we're going to pop that 1 half out. But do you see why that works? Those parentheses are necessary. They're absolutely necessary. So we got our 1 half, our original 1 half. We're going to get this, this little guy is the second 1 half is going to come to the party from inside. And then we're going to be left with 1 minus cosine of u du. Cool? Cool. So we got 1 fourth. I had ambitions to say we were going to go through this and area underneath the curves, but that's OK. This is perfect. This is how it always starts. It's all good. What do you want to do? What is the integral of 1 minus cosine u du? Well, what about that 1? What's the integral of 1? What? Well, what is the integral of 7 dx? What has derivative 7? It's all good. So if we have 7, just a constant, and we're integrating it, what has derivative 7? 7 times just the variable itself. Because let's take the derivative of 7x. Well, that's 7x to the 1 minus 1 with me, because you subtract it. And you drop down the exponent there. That's 7 times 1. That gives you 7 times 1 is 7x to the 0. x to the 0 is just 1 in disguise, so you got 7. So for that reason, if you have the integral of just a constant, you get just that variable. With me? All right. So now, what's the integral of 1 in this problem? No! That's the mistake everyone makes. What are we integrating with respect to? Yeah. And that little du, that differential, tells us what we're integrating with respect to. For so, so for that reason, I'm gonna, not going to go straight to the answer. We're going to rewrite this a little bit. Okay. We're going to take this thing. I don't know why I'm using blue here. There we go. 
I'm going to write this as 1 du minus integral cosine of u du. You with me there? We met like one of the rules about integration is if you have a plus or a minus, you can break it up across the addition and subtraction as long as you keep track of the variable that you're integrating with respect to. And so now when I see it as 1 du, it's easier for me to see that, OK, we got 1 fourth times u, just single u, because it's 1 u. That makes sense? And then what has the derivative of, and I'm, I'm being careful here, this minus sign out front is, is not part of cosine. It's just what has the derivative of cosine? Well, sine has the derivative of cosine. So we got sine of u here, n bracket plus c. Reverse our substitution. All right. Well, I guess one fourth u, u is what? u is 2x. One fourth times 2x minus sine of 2x plus c. Now I'm out of room on this one, so I am going to relatively rudely sneak this one across and say that that becomes 1 half x minus 1 fourth sine of 2x plus c. This is the kind of thing that I say, yes, simplify it further. Whereas that other one where you had 1 fourth, 2 thirds, something to the fractional exponent, minus 5 six, something to the fractional exponent, that's OK to leave kind of multiplied, factored out like that. Did that make sense? OK, cool. Now let's this. That is thank you for being willing to make the mistake that everyone makes. So let's now do it another way. So again, this one's going to be quicker now. We're going to start from circle star. We're going to make our substitution. We're going to say, OK, actually, you know what? I'm going to copy it right over from here, from that step, just the second step down where I drew this little arrow. I'm going to have 1 half out in front. And I'm going to put a big square box because I'm going to break up this integral over the subtraction right now while it's still in terms of dx. 1 dx minus integral cosine of 2x dx end bracket. Well, this means that I have 1 half out in front. 1 dx I can just do. That's just x, right? With me? And then. Now I have a single integral, which I'm going to do a substitution for, where again, u equals 2x dot dot dot, the same logic we used before. This is literally the same exact substitution we used before. So I'm going to be a little lazy to conserve room here and uh, work it again this way. And so we're going to get 1 half square bracket x minus integral cosine of u. dx is 1 over half du. And so now that becomes an integral I can do. 1 half square bracket x minus 1 half. What has derivative of cosine? Well, sine has derivative of cosine, end bracket plus c. And now I've done my integrations, and I'll just reverse my substitution. 1 half x minus 1 half sine of 2x, end bracket plus c. What do we end up with when we distribute that out? We get 1 half x minus 1 fourth sine of 2x plus C, we did it. Those are two ways to do this. There are others. You can go directly from this and do u is equal to 2x and algebras. It's then just very, very careful applications of algebra and integrations where we keep track of the variable that we're integrating with respect to. See why I say it's worth it? Yeah. Do cosine squared. I mean, you can practically see what it's going to be similar to. But you'll have to look up the cosine squared one. It's slightly different. Very similar, but slightly different. OK, that was indefinite integrals. Everything we did was plus c. We haven't plugged in uh, limits of integration yet. But limits of integration using a informal and not entirely accurate notation for indefinite integrals. Integral of the derivative is equal to the original function. And so integral of the derivative is equal to the original function evaluated at VNA. So what are we doing now? I don't know. There are two, may, two methods for dealing with uh, indefinite integrals. And again, both of them have merits. I like one definitely better than the other. 
six way, six one way, half a dozen the other, it does not matter to me. So you can substitute into the integral and then back substitute and then do the limits of integration in terms of the original variable. Basically say, hey, put a pin in it. I'll come back to these limits of integration after I've done the whole problem. That works, that's fine. Uh, the other one is, I mean, actually technically sometimes you have to be careful. You get into depending on the substitution domain and range issues, but it's gonna be okay. Uh, we're not gonna do that necessarily. Substitute the second method, substitute the entire integral into terms of u, but you also change the limits of integration into terms of u with respect to your substitution. Either way you slice it, just be careful you're not plugging u values in for x and x values in for u and vice versa. So let's do it. Uh huh. Let's do it. And as you might guess, two ways. The first one, I titled original variable. The second one I titled substitution variable. So the first one is to do the entire integral like we've been doing and then back substitute and then evaluate in terms of the original limits. The second one will be just switch everything to you, the substitution variable. Okay, three x plus one has derivative three x squared. So this one's one where we can do by direct substitution and while we haven't been doing that, I'm going to for this problem, just again, because they both have times and places. And if you can see a direct one, it's like, oh, that directly works. Sure, good practice. Because there will be cases where that will be really helpful. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna say u is equal to x to the third power. So du is equal to three x squared. Du dx equals three x squared. By just multiplying over that dx, we've got ourselves the direct substitution replacing 3x squared and dx is going to give us just our du. So we're going to use the substitution and I'm going to draw an integral sign. And so if I do my substitution, we get square root of u and then 3x squared dx is directly substituted in for du, right? Oh no, what have I done? Get back here. All right, so now we had limits of integration on this original problem. Do you think it's easy to forget those if you just let them go? It is, very. So I like to put two little dots here. That's to remind me that, hey, this problem, I need to plug some stuff in at the end. Should I be plugging negative one in for you? No, because negative one is the original problem. It has to do with the original variable of dx, x. x is your variable, right? And so if I put one and negative one on this integral with u variables, it's not technically correct. Would me? All right, so now we know how to do square root of u. That's u to the one half power, integral dot to dot, u to the one half du. That's gonna give us equals, you know what, I'm gonna go back over here. I'm just gonna start from the left again. Equals, uh, u to the three halves power times two thirds out in front, vertical bar because we're evaluating. I'm just gonna go ahead and vertical bar those dot dots because it's still in terms of u, I'm not yet ready to plug in because those original bounds are in terms of x. So now we'll reverse our substitution, two thirds quantity x to the third power plus one, all raised to the three halves power. Now, now I've got things back in terms of x, now I can return to those original limits of integration and evaluate this thing from negative one to one. Definite integrals require that I evaluate from the top first and then subtract the bottom one. Two thirds times one to the third power plus one all raised to the three halves power minus and I like to put this one in a parenthesis because just sometimes you got a lot going on and that means I, I remember to distribute the subtraction when I evaluate the low, lower limit of integration. Two thirds times negative one to the third power plus one, all of that jazz raised to the three halves power. Ooh -wee. Okay, so what do we have here? This gives us two thirds. Well, one to the third power is just one plus one gives us two raised to the three halves power minus, well, I, I added those parentheses. I see that I don't need them. So I'm gonna drop it. Two thirds times negative one to the third is negative one, negative one plus one 
oh snap, this is zero. Anything to the zeroth power is just zero. We got, you know what? We got minus zero here. We got this, it's golden. We're golden, we're good. And so now what we have to do is off to the side, we have to play a little bit of algebra. What is two to the three halves power? Well, here's a dirty trick. Two to the three halves is the same thing as two to the one half raised to the third power because power rules, you multiply the exponents. And then two to the one half is the square root of two. Cause I mean, that one doesn't work out nicely. It's not a perfect number, three of them. And what do you do with three square roots of two? Well, when you're multiplying roots, you can multiply them together. So it gives you the square root of eight. Again, not perfect, but square root of four is perfect. So you pop one two out and you have two. Did that make sense? Sweet. So what we have is, that expression becomes two thirds times two, <coughs> excuse me, choking here, <coughs> excuse me, four thirds, uh, four root two <laughs> over three. Ooh. Feel good about that. Shall we do it again? But this time let's do it in terms of you. I don't like X, X is no longer good to me. I don't like it. We're, to, we're going to change the variable. Once again, it's the same substitution, which we're going to just straight up do directly. So same, is that okay if I just write same, is equal to, so we do the same substitutions, equal to, all right, we stop that. All right, uh, we have integral, and then our, our problem becomes the square root of u du. Is that correct? That is that is what the last slide said. You have it on the same page so you can see it. Ah, I love it when I nail it like that. Okay. All right, but where did our limits of integration go? If I proceed with this, I know I'm going to screw it up, right? Okay, so here's the, here's the change. The different part we're going to do in blue. So uh, what these actually mean is they mean x is equal to 1 and x is equal to negative one. We're integrating this function over the x-axis interval, negative one to one. And so under this substitution, what we have is u is equal to x to the third plus one. So u is equal to x to the third plus one. So when x is one, plugging that in to our substitution, we're gonna get u is equal to two. With me? And then plugging that in to our substitution when x is negative one, x to the third is negative one, negative one plus one is zero. We get u, doesn't disappear. Zero is a perfectly good number because we're not like subtracting it here. Stop that. Left-handed problems, sorry about that. Uh, there we go. And now these little guys, these are our lower and upper limit of integration with respect to u now. Yeah. Okay, once again, in a relatively rude abuse of things, dot, dot, dot equals, what is it? It's a two thirds u to the two thirds u to the three halves. Is that right? When we do the integration, u to the three halves. Again, it's the same thing on the prior slide. So I'm not gonna, I'm just doing that. Thank you, I, I, I required help. And then down here, you know what? There's nothing wrong with writing u is equal to zero and u is equal to two to kind of remind yourself that you've made that substitution. And in fact, when you take your next class, because presumably you're going to launch yourself into Calc 3 after this, that becomes exceptionally helpful because you're going to do integrations that involve multiple um, variables. And by labeling them, it really helps you to keep track of what variable you're evaluating for what, because maybe you'll have this same expression, only there will be a Y and a Z in there too that you have to keep track of that. You're not plugging in for Y and Z, you're just plugging in for U and that could be helpful. So we're good to go. And a lot of the algebra is gonna end up being the same because in some way you're doing the same thing just with a slight tweak of order. So two to the three halves minus two thirds, zero to the three halves. Well, that's just zero. And this, for the same reason as last time, is two, uh, four, four root two over three. Which way do you like better? Doesn't matter to me. I tend to like to do things in terms of the original variable. Uh, oftentimes it ends up being somehow more algebra, but really all it is is 
I'm doing the algebra of substitution down here instead of up here, if that makes sense. Um, there are problems that sometimes are only possible by doing this, where in terms of the original value, you'll end up, if you don't make the substitution, it, it just doesn't work and you have to turn the problem in terms of you. So they do exist and they're out there. Will I ever test you on them? No, you may run into them, but we'll talk about them what if we do. Okay, what else are we doing? Should we close this rig out with some trigonometry? Everybody's favorite, but it shows up a lot in Calc 2 and Calc 3. And so I find that part of what I do in this course is review a lot of trig, um, the key, like the, the just key foundational stuff that we have to know. So, um, how many slides do I have? I only have one slide. Let me get more pages before I start this. Uh, page manipulation, insert, I don't know, how many pages do I want? Two pages after page seven, seems good to me. Huh. Are they the same size? I think they are. All right, so let's talk about trigonometry. Do you love the unit circle? It's okay if not. Some people come in and like, I had to memorize it at some point. I don't care if you have it memorized, but what I do care is, and what's gonna make your life easier, is if you understand the key trig values, in other words, sine and cosine, for these key angles. What are the key angles? Well, the first four, the first quadrant, you have zero to radians, 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 pi over two, right? Halfway in between that, one half of half is a fourth, so pi over fourth here. And then between those, well, here I can kind of see the pattern. I can go pi over two. Yeah, that's pi over three between pi over two and pi over four. And then down there, pi over six. Yeah, one six should be the smallest one of these. Okay, those are the key angles and everything else is a multiple of those and just signs positive and negatives depending on which quadrant you're in, et cetera, et cetera. So what we need here is uh, these angles. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now sine and cosine, what they are is they are, or the unit circle, unit is a fancy word for one. How many units did a factor produce? Well, that means one, how many things? Unit means one in math. It literally just means one. So unit circle means radius one. And what, um, what any, any angle theta plugged into a trig function gives you is the x, y coordinate on the unit circle. In particular, the x coordinate is cosine of theta. The y coordinate is sine of theta. Yeah. Okay. Now, well, what's between one and zero? One half. And you know what else is between one and zero? Funny numbers like root two over two and root three over two. Seem reasonable? Well, root two over two is like 1.7 over two. So that's less than one, bigger than half. And root three over two is like 1.8 over two. And that's bigger than, less than one and bigger than one half. And so, okay, that seems fairly, or maybe not, I don't know, you know, whatever. Okay. So the key values have a pattern to them. They go, you count up by ones, zero, one, two, three, four. One thing I notice is that one half root two over two root three over two, those all kind of over two shows up a bunch, right? So you just go ahead and slap them over two, all of them over two, all of them over two. And now another pattern I notice is that you've got these pesky little square roots over the top, right? So I know that I need root three over two and root two over two, and that looks pretty good. But you know what? We're trying to establish a pattern here. And if you want a pattern and a way to remember this, you just slap a square root on top of everything. And if you do that, you get the following. Zero square root is just zero. Zero divided by anything is just zero. One square root is just one. One over two is one half. Root two is just root two over two. Root three is just root three over two. Root four is just two. Yeah, so two over two is exactly. All right, now. What is sine of zero? Because these are the angles, right? Those are, oh, those are not the angles, those are the outputs. But what we want is all the values for theta as it varies between zero and pi over two, yes? 
for these key angles. So what is sine of zero? Well, sine of theta is equal to opposite over hypotenuse, yeah? And so if I tried to pick this up and draw this, I would have it, one would be here because it's the unit circle. And I would be taking sine of the unit circle. And so I'm interested in, well, the radius is always length one and that's the hypotenuse, isn't it? So we can go ahead and, and say, all right, sine of zero is equal to over hypotenuse, it's gonna be over one, isn't it? Now, what is the other length? The other length we're after is this opposite side. What is the length of the opposite side when this angle theta here is reduced to zero? Is there an opposite side anymore? Yeah, the hypotenuse, if you just imagine closing this door, if you will, it's in the perfect circular rotation of a door, you're closing this door as the angle's going down, that opposite length is getting shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter until it literally doesn't exist because you have the hypotenuse of length run laying on the x-axis of length one and it's squeezed it, it's gone. There is no hypotenuse or opposite side and so it's of length zero and zero divided by one is zero. And that turns out that that matches the way that sine graphs like this, whereas cosine starts at the value of one from that. Okay, how does this help us? Well, I know that sine of zero, sine of the angle zero, gives me output zero. With me? And for similar reasons, what is sine of pi over two? Well, sine of pi over two, all of a sudden your opposite side is that when it approaches that is going to be one over one. So sine of pi over two is going to give us one with me. And now all I have to do is count up the angles between there. Well, halfway between zero and pi over two is pi over four. And then that helps me. I'll just start at pi over two and I'll count up in the denominator, pi over two, pi over three, pi over four, pi over six to the left, pi over three, pi over four, pi over six. Now, if we played that game with sine, could we play the exact same game with cosine and figure out that cosine starts at one at angle zero and you know graphs something like this. And so since cosine of zero, cosine of angle zero, these are the angles listed above, the pi's are the angles. I'm gonna start my cosine angle zero below the one off to the right. Similar logic, cosine of pi over two is not gonna have an adjacent length anymore because it'll have collapsed in the vertical. And we fill in the pattern, pi over two, pi over three, count my way up as I get smaller and smaller angles, count my way up in the denominator as I get smaller and smaller angles until I hit zero. Now I know I used two colors here, but this is something that my Calc 1 teacher showed me. And ooh wee, it has been helpful. I had to write it 6,000 times at the top of every page that I ever did any trig homework stuff that asked me this information, I wrote it every single page. And now all I have to do is think, oh yeah, sine of zero is what? That gets me started and it's just the pattern from there and then I can use this. So why did I do that? Because we're gonna spend the last few seconds and minutes of this class doing something that involves it. So let's do it. Okay, huh, what? My goodness, this is a hard one. This is a mean one. You know what we should do? Review the original trig derivatives. Because remember, you're integrating something, you want something that has its original function and its derivative. So what do we see? You can see what the problem is. I can't, it's gone. I think it had a cotangent and it's cosecant squared in there, am I right? Okay, which one of those is the derivative of the other? Okay, so you're telling me cotangent's the function, cosecant squares the derivative. I love it. So with a u substitution, which one's the u, the function or its derivative? Exactly. So in this case, our function was, I think, cotangent with the derivative cosecant. Okay, it had derivative negative cosecant. You know what? We'll see if it comes out in the wash. All right, u substitution. We think that cotangent is a good idea. u is equal to cotangent of x. 
that means du dx is equal to, and I gave myself two slides for this, you may. Do you have a whole sheet of paper? Oh, when I nail it, I nail it. Okay, all of this is unintentional. All right, derivative of that rig is cosecant squared of x. We're gonna solve ourselves for dx. You know what, I'm gonna algebra that dx up into the right by just crossing it off on the left and multiplying it up there, thinking about it that way. And then I'm gonna multiply it by one over cosecant squared to truly isolate that dx. Hey, wait a minute. Shouldn't I have said negative cosecant x when I did the derivative of cotangent? So you know what? Let's slide a little red negative in here. And if you have it, you know, in your paper, you may not have enough room. Do you care at that thing in there? Make it circled. Make sure you don't forget it like I did. All right. So now we've got our negative cosecant of x, and I'm happier now because that's correct. And there's where that negative is going to come from. All right, and we've got du is equal to dx, and let's make, no, let's make this substitution. Okay, I'm gonna do it up here. No, I'm not, that's, I'm gonna do it down here. Okay, uh, equals circle star, circle star equals, and now we're gonna make the substitution. So our integral is gonna be integral from dot to dot because we're changing from variable x to u, and I don't wanna figure this out. I don't, I mean, we could, we could put pi over two into cotangent and figure out what it is and then evaluate it. We're just gonna do that later because it is just doing it later. All right, so dot to dot. And what have we got? Well, we changed cosecant or cotangent to u. We did not touch cosecant squared of x. Now we're gonna multiply by the differential here. All right, so the differential is this stuff, one over negative cosecant squared of x du. Let's reduce those cosecants because that's what we wanted to happen right? And it helps me. I like to circle the negatives so that I don't mix them up. Okay, let's get that negative out in front. Negative dot to dot u du. Okay, I can integrate that. Equals negative one half u squared, applying the power rule. Vertical bar dot to dot because we're still not in terms of x. We don't need plus c here because, you know, definite integral versus indefinite is equal to negative one half, reverse our substitution, u squared. So this is gonna be cotangent squared of x. Evaluated, now that we're back into terms of x, you know what, I'm gonna put x equal there because you know what, even if you don't need it, man, you'll, you'll write me a letter next semester and you'll be like, that was a great idea. Okay, so pi over two, pi over four. I tend to predict that, that uh, everything I teach you guys is gonna go so well and you're gonna be helpful, thanked by it. But you know, you, you'll be the judge of that, you'll see. Okay, uh, should we evaluate this rig? Ooh wee, let's do it. Is equal to, you know what? I'm gonna need another space, so I'm just gonna bring it over onto the next space. Can you help me? Negative is equal to negative one half cotangent squared. Our top angle is pi over two, because I'm plugging it in and evaluating it. Minus, oh, minus big parenthesis, negative one half. Be careful with your signs, right? You're subtracting the whole thing. So minus parenthesis, negative one half cotangent squared of pi over four, end parentheses. How do you want to evaluate cotangent? Our chart only had our two favorite trig functions on it of sine and cosine. 